Hello. Welcome to the first session of C.S. Lewis on Prayer from Oxford, which is a study of the last book that C.S. Lewis wrote, Letters to Malcolm. C.S. Lewis passed away in 1963, and the book was published uh, very near that time. And uh, I, can't, uh, I can't think of a better place uh, to begin our study than in this room here. Uh, we're in the middle uh, bedroom area of the kilns, uh, Lewis's home in Oxford. And right after the war, Lewis made this a study, uh, World War II, and set a desk up here uh, in this room. And um, Walter Hooper, who uh, first met Lewis in 1963 and became his personal secretary, uh, he tells us that uh, Lewis liked to write his books up here and do his correspondence and other things downstairs. And uh, when uh, Walter was in this room, he said you could see on the desk the manuscript to letters to Malcolm. Lewis had wanted to write a book on prayer earlier in his life. In 1952, actually, uh, made an attempt. He wrote 45 pages of manuscript. But he stopped writing the book. And he stopped because he felt like if, if he wrote a book on prayer the way he wrote his books usually, um, it would come across like he was some sort of expert on prayer, and that's the last thing in the world he felt like he was. And so he decided that he just couldn't write a book on prayer uh, without it coming across in the, in the, in the wrong way. He also had a, an important question that, he, he, uh, that, uh, that was very important about prayer that he just could never get straight in his mind uh, at that time. And then um, uh, later in his life, of course, in 63, the idea came to him, well, you know, if, we, if I just did it as a correspondence between two friends, then I'm not preaching to anybody. It's like a conversation that's going on, and we can say whatever we want to say with each other. We can speculate. We can guess at things. We can confess problems to one another and, and so forth. And it would be like listening in on a conversation. And, uh, and, and also... Um, since he wasn't uh, writing a book that he was coming across like this is something to be published to the world, um, that uh, he could therefore speculate and he could imagine things. It just it gave him more scope uh, to, to do this as, as letters. Uh, and so he made up a character. Yes, Malcolm is a fictional character. He gives Malcolm a wife named Betty and a son named George. And uh, Betty and George appear in the letters as well. And uh, he begins to write this book on prayer in this fashion. There are 22 letters or 22 chapters to the book. It's something of an odd book on prayer. Um, some people don't like it. Um, Lewis often, when he had a problem or a question or an issue that was going on in his life, the way he would process it, the way he would think his way through it, would be to write. And so uh, sometimes when he's writing, he's writing for himself as much as anybody else to try to come up with uh, answers and, and to clarify his thinking on, on something. And so um, the uh, Letters to Malcolm is the kind of book that Lewis is interested in on prayer. It, uh, a lot of it is intellectual problems that need answering. And he being uh, an intelligent person, an academic um, he was interested in those kinds of things. Poor Malcolm's wife, Betty, she winds up, of course, this is fiction, she winds up reading some of these letters and rolling her eyes and thinking, why does he have to make prayer so difficult? You know, there's nothing to it. And Lewis admits, yes, he admits to, to Betty, yes, I am I'm making it a little bit difficult. But you have to understand that, um, you know, th this, these are the kind of things about prayer that someone like myself uh, is going to be concerned with and needs to work on. He also gives himself a little bit of an out. You know, if you've read other books by C.S. Lewis, he'll often go off and bypass and say things, and, and sometimes some off-the-cuff statement while he's trying to talk about something else is a real gem that, that might wind up being one of the most important things you get out of the book. And um, he does a good bit of that in, this, in Letters to Malcolm, and, uh, and so, but he gives himself an out because the title of the book is Letters to Malcolm Chiefly on Prayer so that you're forewarned. As for prayer, it is Christian private prayer. It's very much a book about trying to get into the presence of God and knowing that God hears you. That's the main thing that's going on in the book. 
And a lot of the questions and things that he deals with are things that get in our way or that have to be dealt with or that settles us in our hearts so that we can be free to be in the presence of God uh, and be heard by him. There are 22 letters in the book. And they are uh, divided into two main sections. If you read at the end of letter 16, he says, I've written enough about petition. And you realize that all the previous 16 letters have been about petitionary prayer. And uh, the latter part is going to be about what he calls adoration. And uh, he has started with petition because, and he says this, there's a principle that he likes. He gets it from Thomas Akempis uh, in his book on the imitation of Christ. And the principle is that the highest does not stand without the lowest. In other words, the more advanced and complicated things uh, stand upon the more basic and fundamental things. And if you try to talk about the things that are more advanced before you talk about the things that are more fundamental, you may not really be understanding what you're talking about. You need to start at the beginning and then build upon that as you go along. And so Lewis adopts that principle by putting petition, which he thinks is a simpler form of prayer than adoration. He puts petition first and then the adoration. But he uses this principle also as an organizing, uh, as a way of organizing the major sections. So that the section on petition starts out on the simplest, the most fundamental issues, the words that we use, uh, keeping focused on what we're doing, uh, the feelings that we have, these sorts of things. And it works its way up into um, harder questions um, and uh, mysticism and these sorts of things. So, so that he uses a campus's principle to organize the section on petition. The second section, he does some of that. But he admits the fact that he gets pretty distracted in that second section. And so um, it's hard to see that it's all about adoration or that it's organized very well. But there, he does wind up in heaven in the new, uh, new heavens and new earth at the end. So that's about as advanced as things get. That's when our adoration is going to be perfect. So, um, so he does use that principle that way. Now, um, besides the... Uh, organization of the book that I was just telling you about, uh, some of the letters do seem to share topics uh, together. And so they, you can see them grouped uh, a little bit. And the first three letters seem to go together. Um, they are about the words that we use and also about distractions in prayer. Uh, the first chapter, since he's talking about the words that we use, um, is about uh, the use of the Book of Common Prayer in church services. Now, many of you have never seen the Book of Common Prayer. You probably don't know what it is. And uh, so it's rather an odd chapter if, if you have no background in the use of, uh, of a printed liturgy where everything is already all written out for the church to use and you're familiar with the Church of England and, and the Book of Common Prayer. You, you're expecting to have a chapter on prayer and you get this thing and it's like, well, what is this about? But uh, the, the fundamental principle that he's dealing with here uh, is that the uh, Book of Common Prayer uh, has, uh, has the, the standard text that uh, has, uh, has been used for, for centuries uh, was printed in 1662. And um, in the 20th century, people wanted to start to change things. And um, Lewis talks about uh, the clergy who want to um, be creative with the liturgy, but the problem is that the laity, the regular churchgoer, they come to church and they're used to the same thing over and over again, and then when you start changing things, you're distracting them. And Lewis says, the reason we come to church is not to be entertained. We come to church to worship God. We come to get into the presence of God and worship Him. And he liked the sameness. He liked the fact that he, when he would come to church, he knew exactly what was going to be, you know, basically what's going to be said. I mean, there is variety involved here because the passages of Scripture change and, and the Psalms change. And there's, there, there are changes going on, but you know what to expect because it's always done that way. So that uh, he could come and he could focus on the Lord and not be distracted. But when the clergy start playing around with with the liturgy, uh, you know it's 
it, it disturbs his ability to, to, to pray like he wants to pray. And so um, he, he says that really he, he's not, you know, if you, if you want to make changes, if you've got good reasons to make the changes, that's okay. It's okay to make changes. But then leave it alone. Don't be fiddling with it all the time. Let's preserve some sameness. Now we know, and perhaps you're one of them, that there are a lot of people who think, well, if you do the same thing every Sunday, doesn't that lead to a cold religiosity? Doesn't, how can doing the same thing over and over again, when well, you've got to have some variety, and, and aren't you binding the Spirit and keeping Him from being free to do things and so forth? And, and there's a strong element of, um, the strong idea in a lot of uh, Christianity that, uh, uh, if something is of the Spirit, it's spontaneous. <clears throat> and so you have some people who, when they have a worship service, uh, they're, they're ready to do something different every time. But it, what happens is, um, doing something different every time becomes the same thing every time. You're still stuck in something. And what happens is eventually you can only be just so creative and then you wind up doing just a little bit of something different than the same thing over again or you start repeating things. And, and, and it gets to where there, it has its own kind of sameness to it. So at any rate, uh, Lewis, you know, for those of y'all who don't understand you know, why Lewis would like a, a service like this, um, and by the way, there are some people who would think, if you remember the Thomas Aquinas principle, the you had the lower than the higher. They would have thought that if you're going to talk about the liturgy, that would have been high up. But to Lewis, words are just tools. They're they're just a way of conveying our thoughts and our heart to God. And uh, in fact, he talks about how a prayer without any words is probably the the best prayer that there is, um, which is an interesting concept to think about. But um, you know, to him, the words are, are something very basic and, and elemental. And as he goes into the second letter, he uh, talks further about this whole I, I, uh, issue of uh, using other people's words for your prayers. For after all, if you're going to church and everything's all written out and the prayer's included, then uh, you're using somebody else's words for your words to God. And some people would say, well, you know, shouldn't it just be your words from your heart? And Lewis thinks that, you know, for the most part, yes, that's the way it ought to be. Um, but he sees some use for using prayers written by other people. After all, uh, Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer to use. You know, the Lord's Prayer shows up in two different places in the Bible, in, in the New Testament. Uh, there is, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, in this manner pray, and, and he uses the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He gives us that prayer as something of a model or a pattern that we can use to teach us about our own prayers when we pray. So that uh, it's, a, it's a guide, so to speak. But in Luke chapter 11, Lewis tells the disciples, pray this prayer. He says, use these words to pray this prayer, our Father who art in heaven. So Jesus himself gives us a prayer to use, and it's not our words, it's his words, which is not a bad idea to be using Jesus' words in a prayer. Think of the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is just songs. It's just prayers. It's, it's a whole book in the Bible. Um, so uh, it can't be you know, unspiritual to be using somebody else's words when you pray. Th uh, think about how when you're in a prayer meeting and uh, you're praying together in the group and one person is what we say leading in prayer, they're praying a prayer and what you're doing is you're listening to that person and, and when they pray something you're going, amen, yes, you know, that's, I agree with that, that's what I want to. So that you're letting somebody else's words express what's on your heart as well and you're following their lead and um, uh, and so you're you're praying in a way that is not you know basically your own words but someone else's you see how that's that's a practical thing that you, that, uh, uh, that that pe someone can use and <coughs> even though it's not just their own words spontaneously it's not an unspiritual thing to do 
Lewis said, though, that he would, uh, well, he said for, for a long time when he initially became a Christian, his prayers were his own words, but he would use the Lord's Prayer. Um, but then later on in life, he realized, you know, uh, there is some benefit to uh, using other people's prayers for your prayers. Um, recognizing, of course, that you're going to want to use prayers that are, uh, that have stood the test of time, that the church uh, has used, that, um, uh, you know, for the sake of being sure that they're worthwhile and that they're doctrinally correct and those sorts of things. And, uh, in fact, that's uh, the first reason that he gives as to why he would use other people's prayers now and then, not as a regular thing, a steady diet, but now and then, would be because uh, it would help him to keep his doctrine straight. Um, you know, when, we are, when we're praying, it's very easy for us to drift into being sentimental with God because we have this very close relationship with our Heavenly Father through Christ. And um, because it's this father-to-child intimate relationship, we can begin to get, if we're not careful, a little sentimental and we can begin to attribute to God qualities that He does not really have. Um, for example, that all he really cares about is what we care about. Um, you know, you have to watch out for those kinds of things. And so, um, using other people's prayers can help you to keep your prayers doctrinally correct, which is important. Also, it reminds you of what to ask, because if we're just praying all on our own all the time, there can be all kinds of different things that the Lord would like us to share with him in prayer, uh, but we're not because we're not even thinking about it and people in other lands or people in other situations. Um, and so when you're using other people's prayers, they remind, oh, I guess those people do need our prayer too. Yes, I should pray about that. So they're practically helpful. And then the last reason that he said that he would use other people's prayers sometimes is because it would add an element of ceremony. Now, what is that about? Well, he's saying, going back to how intimate and personal our relationship with God is, if, you, if, if you're always praying on that basis and you forget how majestic He is, you forget He is the great God. He is your maker. You forget that Jesus Christ, the reason you can pray is because Jesus Christ went to the cross to die for your sins, to open up a way for you to pray to God. And remembering these things helps you to recognize that yes, He is my loving Heavenly Father, but He is also the awesome God. And it is an amazing privilege for me to be able to come to Him in prayer. It's a blood-bought privilege. And I need to be careful how I come to God. Um, and so, uh, the, that little bit of an element of ceremony, a little bit of formality, reminds you, you know, like it says in the Bible about, you know, when you come into the house of God, uh, be careful what you do. And then the last, well, the third letter, the last one I'm considering this session, uh, the letter three, uh, has to do with a, a number of different things that uh, affect our concentration, like at what time of day do we pray? Do we kneel or do we not kneel? And where do we pray? Where's a good place to pray? And uh, Lewis has a lot of really in, enjoyable uh, and helpful things to say about those issues. Uh, but while Lewis has put words down on the very bottom of importance, um, we do need to, to recognize, and he does too, of course. Um, I mean, he's included it in the book. Um, this is worthwhile considering. But we need to remember that our words do matter. As the psalmist says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I need to be careful of the things that I say to God. And, uh, and so we, we want to think, of, we want to remind ourselves, who am I talking to? Uh, what do I know about him that's true from the scriptures? And uh, what is really going on in my heart? What's really the truth? So that my words are expressing the truth and not something that I'm just making up. Because sometimes people think that when they come to God, they're thinking about his awesomeness or whatever, uh, and they feel like that they've sort of got to put on a face. That they've till we have faces. He's, they've got to put on something of a face. You're not really expressing the true person. You're putting on a show with your words. And that's not Christian prayer. And after all, because God sees right through it all. 
I found new believers in Christ. Sometimes when, when they are praying uh, before a group of people, they're very self-conscious about their prayers. And so um, they will imitate prayers that they've heard in, in church or small group or Bible study or whatever. And you can tell that they're just trying to say the right thing. Um, and, and, and they need to grow out of that. Uh, and then, of course, there's the hypocrites in Matthew chapter 6 who stand on the street corners and use these flowery words. And, of course, we know some of them stand in pulpits uh, and other places in our churches uh, using great speeches, and they're really praying to the public. You know, they want to be known as a godly person. Um, the words we use, you see, can be important. Uh, what do you do about your words when you're praying uh, just on your own and you're not using a prayer from uh, a book of prayers, the book of common prayer or something? You trust the Holy Spirit to help you to pray. That's where Romans 8 comes in, where it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmity. He knows that we have weakness, and He helps us to pray. So what you do uh, is you don't, you don't think that you've got, you, know, you don't wait until you've got everything worded and you know exactly what you're going to say and the rest of it. But instead, uh, you trust the Spirit of God, and you open your mouth, and you pray. Just, you know, just think of something about God that you appreciate and you're thankful for and start thanking Him and just start telling Him about how you love Him and, and honor Him and these sorts of things. And trust the Spirit of God to begin to, to lead your heart. And you'll find Him carrying you along. You'll find the words coming to you and flowing. If they don't, maybe you're just worn out and uh, maybe you are, have just been under too much stress or something. There are these very practical considerations to take into account. But by and large, I know that that's what I do, um, that if, if it's time for me to pray uh, in, you know, before people or something, and I, you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about, uh, then I just start praying, and I trust the Holy Spirit to help me. Of course, there are other times when... Um, our hearts are overcharged with burdens and cares and these sorts of things. And so um, we just bring those things to the Lord and uh, just express our hearts just as we are because He already knows about it all anyway. And, um, and He wants us to be true with Him and be honest with Him in, in our relationship with Him because that's the only way that we can really have a relationship that goes from, um, from a point of strength to strength. Thank you.